Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, and welcome to the next session on the Nutrition Innovation Lab uh, uh, Legacy event on September 17th, 2021. My name is Chris Duggan. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and a professor in the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. It's been my pleasure to be a collaborator at the Nutrition Innovation Lab for the past 10 years, both in some of the works that you'll be hearing about in this session, but also uh, working with Dr. Becky Raj in the Bangalore Boston Nutrition Collaborative. So it's been a great two days and I've really learned a lot and um, have really um, looked forward to today's session as well. Uh, harking back to, to some of Patrick's opening comments yesterday, uh, he mentioned that when the Nutrition Innovation Lab had started, uh, the hypothesis was that child health and child nutritional status was directly linked to the access to, to food and food insecurity levels. But uh, indeed, as he previewed, and as we'll hear about more today, uh, the mere access to uh, adequate amounts and quantities of food is probably uh, necessary, but not sufficient for adequate child health and nutrition. In fact, we'll hear today about the fact that the food needs to be safe and the food needs to be um, free of toxins and free of pathogens. And not only that, but the gastrointestinal tract needs to process it in a way that's um, beneficial for the child and the growing infant. So it really is my pleasure to introduce uh, four people who are going to walk us through this different aspects of what it means for um, safe and nutritious food to be available and absorbed uh, by the human body. The first speaker is my colleague, Dr. Jacqueline Lauer. Dr. Lauer is a public health nutritionist and clinical assistant professor at Boston University. Her research focuses on environmental contributions to poor growth and development among infants and young children in low resource settings, including environmental enteric dysfunction, and aflatoxin exposure. The next speaker is Dr. Akriti Singh. Dr. Singh is a nutrition and health systems advisor with the USAID Advancing Nutrition Project. Her research focuses on determinants of maternal and child undernutrition in low and middle income countries, including strengthening health services, diets, body composition, environmental enteric dysfunction, gut microbiota, and water sanitation hygiene. She holds a PhD from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy and an MPH from Yale. The third speaker is Dr. Joanna Andrews Trevino. Dr. Andrews Trevino is a multicultural public health nutritionist seeking to strengthen the nexus between nutrition, agriculture, and health policy in a global context. Prior to becoming an AAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow at USAID, she worked on two USAID-funded research projects as a member of Feed the Future Innovation Lab at Tufts University. She has a PhD in food policy and applied nutrition from Tufts, as well as a master's degree in public health sciences with a specialization in health economics and health promotion from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. She holds an undergraduate degree in kinesiology from Rice University. Our final speaker is Dr. Saif Islam, by training, Dr. Seifel is an agricultural economist with a PhD from the University of Bonn, Germany. He is based at the Department of Agricultural Economics at the Bangladesh Agriculture University. Dr. Seifel's research interests focus on the adoption and impact assessment of different technologies, policies, and institutional innovations, with a particular focus on developing countries' agriculture by, the range, by using a range of cross-sectional and panel microeconomic econometric techniques, including experimental and quasi-experimental methods. Thanks in advance to all of our panelists, and let me turn it over to Dr. Lauer. Great, thank you so much, Chris, for that introduction, and um, thank you to USAID and the Nutrition Innovation Lab for all of their continued support um, over these years, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to be here to recognize what I know to be 10 years of very hard work. And I'm thrilled to be part of this session um, among a group of very inspiring colleagues and friends. So with that, I have um, a few goals for my talk this morning on environmental enteric dysfunction or what we call EED. Um, first, I'd like to just describe what is EED. And in doing so, I hope to highlight or to point out a number of the key challenges 
that um, we face when studying this rather complex condition. And I also wanna highlight in my talk, a few of the studies that I was a part of uh, during my time at the lab in which we really attempted to answer or address a number of these key data gaps. And finally, I want to end by touching on, a, on the potential for intervention studies as a next step personally for my work and generally um, to this work um, at the Innovation Lab. Um, so are my slides running? Okay. So EED observed from the luxury of an intestinal biopsy is quite obvious and it's also quite striking. Um, you can clearly see here the inflamed um, blunted villi and the resulting loss of absorptive um, surface area. However, the pathophysiology of ED is actually much more complicated than even this picture um, lets on. Um, so next. So here you can see that EED is also characterized by a loss of tight junctions, um, subsequent microbial translocation, and a systemic inflammatory response. So to summarize, EED is not just one thing, but rather there are various uh, domains of the condition. Next. Because there are these different domains, there have been um, numerous proposed and studied biomarkers um, across the different biospecimens, including in urine and stool and blood. So for example, ones that I often worked with during my time at NIL were serum markers of anti-flagellin and anti-LPS uh, immunoglobins, which are considered to be microbial translocation markers. Um, next. And it is worth noting that um, studies which have um, collected panels of different EED markers uh, show that they're often very poorly correlated with one another. And, did, and indeed, we observed this in our work in, and at NIL when we compared antiflagellin and anti-LPS IGs to uh, what at the time was the more commonly used uh, lactulose mannitol test. Furthermore, very few of the proposed markers have any established cut points and so it shouldn't be a surprise that there remains no agreed upon case definition or diagnostic criteria for EED. Next. So from seminal necroscopy studies, we do know that EED is an acquired condition. It is hypothesized to arise from living in conditions of poor water and sanitation and hygiene and constantly interacting um, with these microbes. Next. However, there are surprisingly few studies in the published literature which have actually linked or shown a link between a specific environmental exposure or a specific microbe for that matter and ED. And thus this only remains a hypothesized relationship though certainly it is one that has great biological plausibility. Next. And so even still much less is known about other purported causes of the condition including exposure to toxins, such as aflatoxins and other mycotoxins and various uh, micronutrient deficiencies. So finally, studies linking EED biomarkers to poor child growth outcomes, uh, particularly stunting, while numerous in literature are also extremely inconsistent. Furthermore, we have almost no studies looking at EED in populations um, other than young children, um, including, for example, in pregnant women. Next. And when a relationship between EED and growth is observed, often we are only left to speculate on the exact mechanisms and the relative importance of each one. For example, it is difficult to know if an observed relationship is due to diminished surface area and malabsorption, increased nutrient requirements, or perhaps growth hormone resistance due to systemic inflammation. Next. And finally, much less is known about the relationship between EED and other health outcomes, including such things as oral vaccine response, cognitive developments, and micronutrient deficiencies. Next. So during my time at NIL, I was fortunate to be part of several studies um, in Uganda, which were looking to answer some of these outstanding questions. 
So first we performed a study which examined the association between poor water quality and subsequent EED in children in rural Uganda. One interesting thing of note about the study was that we actually measured household water quality in our sample using portable water quality test kits. And I really encourage this over simply looking at primary water source as an exposure variable, which in our study we found to be ill-correlated with contamination. Nevertheless, we did find a relationship between contaminated water measured using the kits and EED. And this is one of the few studies that we actually have linking a particular environmental exposure to EED. Next. We also performed a study looking at the association between EED and poor growth, as well as various markers of iron status in rural Ugandan children. So this study is most notable to me because it is one of the first studies to look at an association between EED and micronutrient deficiencies. And as I mentioned, we did find one between EED and iron status. We also found an observed association between EED and poor linear growth in this study. Next. And finally, we conducted a small birth cohort study specifically designed um, to look at the role of maternal EED during pregnancy and birth outcomes. Um, yes. To our knowledge, this was the first study to look at EED in a population of pregnant women. And overall, we did find an association between maternal EED and shorter gestational age at birth and shorter infant lengths at birth. Next. And one more, please. So this previous work um, with EED and um, in seeing these associations throughout my time at NIL between EED and child growth, between EED and micronutrients and in birth count outcomes when it comes to mothers um, across various cohort studies has uh, since left me very interested in intervention studies. Primarily when we talk about EED intervention studies, um, these fall into three primary categories. The first is those that are aimed at improving water and sanitation. Though recent trials we know have highlighted the limitations of using rudimentary wash interventions as an effective EED intervention. So we probably need to be thinking more along the lines of wash plus or, or total wash um, if we're thinking about pursuing um, further wash um, interventions for EED. Next. The next category of interventions involves medications, including those to treat ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, as well as antibiotics such as azithromycin. Um, but so far we have not shown much success um, in terms of medications um, being promising EED um, interventions. And next. And finally, various food and micronutrient supplements are of interest. And during my no funded postdoc, Chris and I actually published a study looking at EED markers in the context of a um, trial of zinc and multivitamin supplementation, and we did not see any effect. But nevertheless, I am continuing some of this work, and I'm currently in the process of collecting EED biomarkers in the context of an SQLNS trial. So even though intervention trials have yet to yield much in the way of promising results, I do think this is an area that we must um, continue to explore given what we have already observed uh, from our cohort studies. Um, so with that, I want to thank you so much for your attention, and I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Preeti Singh. Thanks, Jackie. Um, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Um, so we heard that there are several open questions or further areas um, for investigation when it comes to environmental and tired dysfunction. And one area that uh, Jackie talked about is um, you know, the issue of measuring EED, which my presentation will focus on. Next slide, please. To highlight this point about why we need new markers to measure EED, I'd like to walk you through this diagram on the right, which goes from the environmental contaminants resulting from poor wash or poor storage and handling practices of food, exposing the child to environmental contaminants or pathogenic microbes, which the child ingests. This leads to changes in the microbiota or the microbes that colonize the small intestine, leading further to changes in the structure and function of the small intestine. 
These can be measured as increased permeability, inflammation, as well as other aspects of the immune response. So far, as Jackie mentioned, um, the way to measure EED has been to use the lactulose mannitol test. But there are several limitations with this particular measure, including that it's very difficult to conduct among children, and also that it is a measure of intestinal permeability only and not of some of these other changes that are occurring during EED. And so in the more recent years, several emerging biomarkers have been explored. These include host fecal mRNA transcripts, fecal proteins, and also the microbiota. In collaboration with the USAID-funded Food Aid Quality Review, the Innovation Lab undertook a study in Sierra Leone where we measured EED among children with moderate acute malnutrition or moderate wasting using some of these emerging biomarkers as well as the lactulose mannitol test. Specifically, these were children who were enrolled in a supplementary feeding program, so they received treatment for moderate acute malnutrition, uh, which was in the form of either RUSF or several fortified blended flowers, and they received this treatment for up to 12 weeks or um, when they recovered if that was sooner. And we wanted to measure EED using these emerging biomarkers, but also to look at the association between EED and several outcomes, such as growth, but also treatment outcomes, such as recovery from MAM, and also look at household wash conditions because these are the hypothesized um, causes of EED. Next slide, please. So what did we find in these, this study in Sierra Leone? Well, when we looked at the relationship between EED and growth, what we found was that children who had high intestinal inflammation measured using the mRNA-based marker, they had lower growth status measured using length for age or weight for length. When we looked at the association between EED and recovery from MAM within 12 weeks, what we found was that children who had high gut defense or a more robust um, immune system, they were more likely to recover within 12 weeks. We also found that children who had high intestinal permeability measured using one of the fecal proteins, alpha-1 antitrypsin, were less likely to recover from EED, sorry, recover from MAM. And if you'd like to know more about um, this particular study and these markers, please refer to the paper that we published um, recently. Next slide, please. So we, when we looked at the association between EED and microbiota, what we found was that children with high intestinal inflammation measured using the mRNA base score were enriched in inflammogenic taxa or some of the harmful microbes. And this you can see on your right. Similarly, children who had low levels of inflammation measured using the mRNA-based score were enriched in more of the probiotic or beneficial taxa or microbes. When we looked at the relationship between EED and household wash conditions, what we found was that children who lived in households with improved drinking water source had lower intestinal permeability using several markers, such as the mRNA-based score, um, lactulose mannitol excretion ratio, as well as um, alpha-1 antitrypsin. So what do these findings mean? Well, I think there are two key takeaways from these findings. The first is that some of these emerging biomarkers are very promising and should be explored in further studies looking at the association between EED and its consequences, such as growth and recovery from MAM, but also for some of the relationship between EED and its causes, such as poor household wash conditions. And the second is that, as we heard from Jackie's presentation, some of the interventions that have been used to treat EED have been unsuccessful. And perhaps that's because we have not been targeting the microbiota. And so future studies and future invest, um, interventions should be targeting the microbiota in order to treat EED. Thank you so much for this opportunity to present. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Andrew Stravino. Thank you. Thank you, Akriti. Good morning, my name is Joanna Andrews Trevino. Um, and just like everyone else, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to see all these, these colleagues I haven't seen in a while and to just share the 10 years of great work that's been done at the Nutrition Innovation Lab. So I am gonna present on a study that also looked at EED to some extent, uh, but for the most part was focused on mycotoxin exposure and the relationship to child growth. In, and this study was a birth cohort study conducted in Nepal. Next slide. This uh, 
complex diagram, I think just goes to, to show you how long the study was and how much work went into it. It was a study that went on from 2015 to 2019. We had two phases, the phase on the, the left in red text, that was our original phase in which we followed, we recruited women at pregnancy, it was about 1700 women. And then we followed up with the women and the children up to one year of age. And then the second phase, we were able to add on afterwards to follow the children up to two years of age. It, the pictures you see here on the left-hand side, um, we did a maternal blood draw when the women were pregnant to test for aflatoxin B1. And then we also tested the children's blood at three months, six months, 12 months, and 18 to 22 months to also measure aflatoxin B1. We also collected a breast milk sample when the children were three months of age to test for aflatoxin M1. And at 18 to 22 months, we were able to add on a couple of other mycotoxins. Um, we analyzed for ochratoxin A in blood and also collected a urine sample to test for Don and Pumanacin and also uh, conduct the LM test, um, which Jackie and Akriti have nicely described. And um, as I mentioned kind of in the title, the, the main objective was to understand this relationship of early life exposure to aflatoxins, the toxins, um, in the first 24 months of life and its relationship to, to growth. So next slide, please. These um, pictures just show you a little bit of the field data collection. On the top left, we have an interview with the mother. Usually the interviews took place in the household. Um, since this is a longitudinal study, you, you, we tried really hard to make sure that our participants were comfortable since the visits were so frequent and it was all electronic data collection. Bottom left is a maternal blood draw. Top right is one of our very young children with their blood draw. And the bottom right is um, the LM test with one of the older children. Next. This table shows you uh, the results of the aflatoxin B1 levels in the blood for both the pregnant women and the four time points in which we collected blood from the children. And as you can see in the red box, there was a high occurrence of aflatoxin exposure both during pregnancy and during the first two years of life. We saw that about 94% of the women had detectable levels of aflatoxin B1 in their blood and about 75 to 85% of the children, depending on the time point. And in the middle column, um, those show the mean levels of aflatoxin. And I just wanna highlight that the tau levels, as you can see, kind of creep up as the children get older, which is something that we expected given that the diet um, starts to expand and become more of an adult diet. Um, so if we saw it at three months of age, six months of age, we'd expect it to then also increase in, in, in our data. Next. So one of our first analyses we did was to uh, test the relationship between the maternal aflatoxin levels and birth outcomes. And we looked at low birth weight, we looked at small for gestational age, and we looked at stunting, for example. And we found that maternal um, aflatoxin levels were associated with um, higher odds of being born small for gestational age. Next. So this little rainbow graph, um, what I wanna highlight here is that these are the length for age these spores for these children in our cohort. Um, across the different time points. And um, length for HD scores were dropping as the children got older, which was also what we expected based on previous data showing the high stunting levels in Nepal. Um, at birth, we had about 15% of the children who were categorized as stunting. At 12 months, it was 27%. And at the 18 and 24 month visits, it was 40%. Next. This table, while a little complex, um, I think is, is, is our, one of our main findings in which we were able to test those repeated measures of aflatoxin um, exposure in the children and repeated measures of anthropometry. So that longitudinal design really allowed us to have multiple measures on the same children and look at that relationship. And here it shows you the results for, for length, length for AG score, stunting, and knee heel length. And we did find that the changes in the aflatoxin lysine ADA concentrations were significantly associated with these measures of linear growth. And then we also found um, that 
we did an exploratory analysis because we were seeing that um, aflatoxin had this relationship with weight too. In our exploratory analysis, we adjusted the aflatoxin levels of the children by the child's weight and saw how that affected the relationship with these outcomes. And we saw an even more pronounced um, relationship with these out outcomes once we adjusted for that weight factor. Next. So as I mentioned in that um, timeline diagram, we were able to collect uh, other mycotoxin data in the second phase, which was, which was great because a lot of the research um, is justifiably been done on aflatoxin. We know that aflatoxin is a carcinogen um, and these others are categorized as either likely carcinogens um, or, or possible carcinogens. And there's been some, some research and, and a call, I think, for action on really looking at these other mycotoxins too, because even though aflatoxin, um, we know a little bit more about and what the possible mechanisms could be, these could also be implicated in growth. And so we were able to measure those. And as you can see in this table, um, we did see a high occurrence of mycotoxin co-exposure in these children at 18 to 22 months of age. So we saw that 100% of children were exposed to fumonisin B1 and ochratoxin A and 87% to Don, in addition to the aflatoxin measure that we took. Next. And what we ended up doing with this mycotoxin data is we analyzed the relationship of each individual mycotoxin with these outcomes, but we also wanted to make sure that we analyzed, um, we analyzed them together because a lot of foods can contain multiple mycotoxins um, these kids are obviously uh, exposed to multiple mycotoxins at one time. So we wanted to kind of test out these combined effects or if we're seeing the aflatoxin re relationship possibly changing once we um, adjust for this exposure to other mycotoxins. And as you can see in the red box with aflatoxin, we saw this consistent story where aflatoxin um, is associated with worth, worse growth outcomes. Um, even once we adjust for these other mycotoxins. And we did not see um, any strong relationships with these other mycotoxins. And in this model, we also included the LM ratio as a measure of EED. And to because this is one of the pathways that um, Jackie alluded to in her presentation, that's been suggested between mycotoxin exposure and poor growth outcomes. So just to make sure that we adjust for that piece, um, and we did not see any modification of the relationship between aflatoxin and growth outcomes once we incorporated that measure. Next. So just a few key takeaways from this study. Um, we found widespread exposure to various mycotoxins in the first thousand days. This is very uh, unique data. There's not a lot of data on mycotoxin exposure from the, the health and, and nutrition um, aspect. And especially in this region, there's not a lot of data. The findings do add to the body of evidence hypothesizing that aflatoxin may be a contributor to poor child growth and do suggest that reducing mycotoxin, uh, aflatoxin exposure in particular, uh, may have positive effects on child growth. We did see the weight bearing effects, which I mentioned which are an emerging priority issue that require deeper understanding, um, possibly future research. Uh, we did an exploratory analysis, but this is something that needs to be understood a little, understood a little bit further. And there was previous research showing that there might be age varying effects in these relationships. So something to consider in the future. I think that um, from the study, we were also reminded of We've been talking about a food systems approach for nutrition, a food systems approach for food safety is also um, equally important to be considered and, and having conversations about. We know that exposure comes from a variety of sources. I mentioned that a single food can contain multiple um, contaminants. And um, we, we also, even though I wasn't able to show this data today, we know that there's various channels of exposure that could be happening. So taking just a household approach, for example, to reducing contaminants may not be sufficient. In our study, we actually found that our, our participants were um, procuring their aflatoxin-prone foods from various sources, um, from, from their own production, 
but also from the market, even in exchanging with other families. And so taking this systems approach might have a bigger impact on reducing these exposures. And then lastly, um, oh, no, sorry, go back to the slide. Last point. Um, effective research does require a rigorous design, which we were able to implement. This longitudinal design um, really allowed us to answer our questions um, and really Im improved our the empirical data that we were uh, producing. But I think that in conjunction with that, it's, it was really important that we had partnerships that were rooted in mutual respect and good communication. Um, Dr. Burrell this morning, he did a great job describing a lot of the things that we're, we're proud of in the study, because when you have a longitudinal um, study like this, there's a lot of moving parts and it's for, it's for multiple years that you're doing the study with the same household. So we really put a lot of effort and time into building trust with the community, into giving routine updates to different stakeholders and getting their input throughout the design and the implementation. And I think that really did help us collect the data that we needed in, in order to answer our research questions. So now next slide. I just wanna thank our collaborators and team. It was a really big group. Um, I wanna thank USAID for funding this study, all our partners in Nepal and all the team in Boston and all the universities and other innovation labs that we worked with and particularly our participants who really were very patient with us as we visited and revisited their children um, and were able to implement this study in Banka, Nepal. So thank you so much. I will pass it to Dr. Islam. And thank you, Pete. I'm happy to hear present some of the findings that I'm working on with Nutrition Innovation Lab. And uh, I'll be talking on consumer concern on food safety and quality in Bangladesh. Next slide, please. Uh, as we all know that agri-food system is changing quite rapidly, not only in the developed countries, but also in developing countries, as well as income, livelihood is also increasing uh, in the developing world, like including in Bangladesh. And because of all this, consumers now are now increasingly concerned about food safety and quality, as well as nutrition, health, and well beings. And we all know that food safety quality is very much linked with the food security and nutrition. So it is very much necessary to study actually if the consumer is concerned on food safety and quality, then that could lead like avoiding consumption and that will lead like uh, adverse nutritional effects. So it's, it's necessary, necessary to study this. And under this backdrop, here in this study, we aim to investigate the consumer concern about food safety and quality on different food items, including the high value food items. And if they are concerned, then we also investigate why. I mean, what are the reason for concern and how they cope up with that concern actually. And lastly, we also investigate what are the determinants? I mean, why some are concerned and some are not concerned, what makes them concerned actually. And uh, for answering those questions, we have used two rounds of panel data from Bangladesh and uh, we use number of panel econometrics to investigate particularly for the identifying the determinants actually. And uh, also interestingly, which is like kind of new or kind of addition to the existing literature, we also look at the dynamics of concern like some consumer are concerned in the first round, but not in the second round, but some are not concerned in the first round, then why they are concerned in the second round. What determines such dynamics, we also studied that here, which is kind of the value addition to the existing studies. Here are some of the results. Uh, at first, the concern, you can see the round one and round two results here. Next slide, please. Sorry. Yeah, here. The round one and round two, you can see in the round one, different food items like meat, dairy, fish, fruits, and vegetables. Here it shows the number of consumer concern and not concern. Here we can see like almost in all food items, near about half of the consumer are concerned on food safety and quality of those food items. And in the second round, if we see this concern increases, like it's now more than half of the consumer are concerned on all those food items 
mostly are high value food items. Then next slide, please. Here you can see what I was talking about the dynamics. In the round one, if you see the data set, uh, like near about 13, 1400 consumer are concerned on food safety and quality, and um, more than 1500 are not concerned on food safety and quality. But in the second round, these two groups split into actually four groups, like who are concerned in the first round, they split, still concerned, like continuously concerned, but some are not concerned anymore. Then in the not concerned group also split into group, they now newly concerned, like become concerned in the second round and, and some group still remain the non-concerned. And that means, all this makes this kind of dynamics and why and we here, we studied that why uh, these dynamics come, so what determines such dynamics here. Then here, next slide, please. Here, we also look, as I already said, the reason, I mean, what are the, why they are concerned and it's based on the survey results. We have seen here, we can see here, mostly like taste, appearance, texture, and then nutritive value of the food items in case of uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, chemical use are the main concern, main reason for concern on the food safety and quality. And in the, and how they cope up with that concern, they said, like you can see here, mostly like the higher bar, it shows like, 70 to 80 percent of the consumer is still buy, although they are concerned, but they bought it after checking whether it's good or bad. And the 10 to 20 percent did not buy because they are concerned that maybe there is something bad there. And you can imagine if they don't buy such food items, then it's, yeah, there is a great implication for nutrition here. Yeah. Next slide, please. Then here, this is the findings from the panel economic TC. I didn't show here, but it's kind of the summary results here. Uh, what are the determinants of SAS concern, like who are concerned on food safety and quality? And results shows like mostly the male-headed households, higher educated, then comparatively richer households, and who have access to elect electricity, as well as located long distance from the market and also who purchase more number of food items from the market, they are more concerned than the opposite group. And we also find like some sort of temporal and spatial disparities like location effect. Uh, if any house are located in the district, Dhaka district, like and the Bodishal district, they are more concerned than the, in the Kulna district, actually we, this is far away, a bit, bit far away from the capital city. And uh, interestingly also we found that who produce like own produced food, particularly the high blue food items, particularly like fish and fruits, they are less concerned than who purchase from the market. That means own production diversity actually reduces concern on food safety and quality. This is quite interesting results. And now the kind of conclusion and implication of this study that we have seen like consumers are not confident about the safety and quality of the food items. They purchase and for various reasons that I described like uh, appearance, taste and other things, also infestation. And uh, food safety and quality also in the developing countries, I mean, not only export phenomena earlier, in the developing countries, we always think like food safety and quality, this issue only in the export issue, like because when you export, such issues comes because of the restrictions, rules, regulations they have to follow for export. But as we have seen, the domestic consumer are also concerned on food safety and quality. So food safety and quality, not only export phenomenon, and we need to look at the domestic consumer as well. Uh, now, then we also find like the own production diversity reduces food safety and quality concerns. So how do be the policy implications? I would say uh, that means that policies and programs should encourage agriculture diversification 
which will reduce food safety and quality concern, as well as we all know that this is very much linked with the dietary diversity. So this will work in both side, reducing concern and the other side, it will increase the nutrition. That means ultimately that will help in food security and nutrition improving. And finally, uh, also we suggest uh, from this study like better management of insect pests and diseases and chemical input as well as like the SEP method, like uh, integrated post uh, pest management and overall food environment improvement would sub substantially reduces consumer worries about food safety and quality. So all the programs policies should look for such SEP measure in agricultural production that may reduce like the consumer concern on food safety and quality. I think uh, that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, USAID. Thank you, Nutrition Innovation Lab for funding this study. I think I now get back to Professor Christopher. Thank you, uh, Saipo, and thank you to all of our panelists for a really outstanding presentation. Uh, we, we do have some time for some questions, and uh, several have been proposed from the audience uh, as well as uh, others. And uh, let me, let me um, go through some of those, if I may. The first one is for uh, Dr. Uh, Lauer. So, Jackie, I noticed that in one of your slides you talked about um, how uh, the, the relative lack of studies that have shown some improvement in EED biomarkers with, a, with an intervention. Um, can, and then you alluded to some studies you were pursuing with SQLNS. Can you, for our audience, um, briefly tell us what SQLNS is and uh, how it might impact on EED? Yeah, sure. So um, thanks for the interest um, in the latest of the studies. Um, so SQLNS is just a small quantity of lipid nutrient supplements. So it's a, essentially the same kind of formulation of plumping nut, but um, in small quantities given um, daily to children. So um, similar to what Chris and I did in the context of a micronutrient and zinc trial, we have a trial looking at SQLNS enrolling children um, when they're 6 to 11 months of age, following them for about 18 months. And we have um, plans to attach a lot of kind of EED biomarkers onto, um, onto that study, but as well uh, also look kind of inspired by some of the previous work at the microbiome to see if we can es establish some, uh, some linkages between um, the gut microbiome um, and EED. So I'm very happy to kind of be continuing the work that I started um, with NIL and uh, continuing to be inspired by colleagues and colleagues' findings um, at NIL um, in kind of the work that I have um, today. Um, Chris, is that, was that? All the question? Yes, yes, perfect. Thanks, Jackie. Um, let me uh, turn to um, uh, Joanna and uh, ask her a question that's been posed from the audience, which is this idea that from uh, Ahmed, who says, we've gained a lot of information in terms of the association between EED and alpha toxin exposure. And there are several studies that show conflicting results. In your opinion, where are we now in terms of the strength of the evidence supporting the relationship between these two exposures and child development? And what is needed to be done to establish whether this association is true or strong or causative? Thanks, Joanna, for your thoughts. Thank you, Chris, and thanks, Ahmed, for that question. I think that you bring up a, a good point, Ahmed, of this kind of, um, mixed results at this point, and, and at least in our study, we didn't, we expected to see, I think, a, a stronger relationship between EED and we had multiple mycotoxins to relate it to and we didn't see that. Um, I think given how new these are still in relative terms, there's still a lot to do. And um, I think the, the research that um, has been mentioned by my other colleagues um, is trying to address that to some extent. And I think that we haven't quite reached the point to say um, that they're causal and even studying them together might um, not quite be the, the sole approach right now. I think there's a, there's a lot of overlap between them, but there's also um, 
many other pathways that have been proposed that haven't been studied, at least for mycotoxins to growth. And therefore we need to kind of expand that area of study a little bit more while continuing to perhaps try to establish a stronger um, link with EED. Um, I think, yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Joanna. Uh, here's a, a question for Preeti that's been posed uh, based on the slide that compared different patterns of the gut microbiota. Um, and the question is, does altered microbiota cause EED or does EED cause the altered microbiota? I laugh because that's a great question. And thank you so much um, for raising that. I think for a while that was the chicken and egg question, right? Which comes first. Um, but I will share that there was a recent paper published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine that kind of established that um, altered microbiota is the cause. And how this group did that was they first looked at the microbiota of kids with stunting, and they found that there were about 14 taxa that were, you know, signature taxa for kids with stunting in Bangladesh. And then what they did was they took that and they transplanted it in germ-free mice. So mice that did not have any microbes in their gut. So these 14 were the only ones that the mice got. And then they took biopsies of the small intestine and showed that that led to enteropathy. And so this study does establish that the altered microbiota is a cause um, of EED, which I think is, is, very, um, is very exciting and answers a question that we've been um, seeking an answer to for some time now. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Akriti for that uh, answer. Uh, a question for uh, Joanna from Dr. Felicia Wu, who says, uh, excellent presentations. Um, there are no validated biomarkers yet for okra toxin A exposure, um, and it's a renal toxin. So this may be why no association was found. Are there any studies that you know of linking kidney function and child growth? I think my colleague Felicia Wu has <laughs> really pointed out um, one, of the, one of the limitations I think we have in studying these, these other mycotoxins right now. I am not aware of any studies, uh, Felicia. I, I think that we expanded the work by being able to to at least attempt um, this in the study, but there's still so much we need to do in terms of validation of the biomarkers. I think that for aflatoxin, we've um, done a better job, but for these others, we're still, I think, in the, the creation phase, and I'm, I'm happy to chat more with you about this. I know you always have some great suggestions. Excellent, thanks, Joanna. And I have a follow-up question myself, which is, uh, I noticed that you pointed out that aflatoxin was more strongly associated with growth outcomes not just with the other uh, toxins, but also with the lactulose mannitol ratio. So what does this tell us about that test or what does this tell us about the relationship between toxin exposure and EED? So Chris, are you referring to the last table um, where that relationship was a little bit stronger? Right, and in fact, there was a non-significant relationship between lactulose mannitol ratio uh, and child growth. Yeah, that's correct. Well, it was significant for weight and height, but not the other measures um, that are composite measures or, or binary measures. Um, so first of all, I don't want to compare, I think, the aflatoxin results that were looking at the, the exposure repeatedly, um, because those were, that's a totally different methodology um, using, you know, multiple measures of the predictor and the outcome. Um, and so, so that could, it's not comparing apples to apples if we do that. Um, but I think that we, we, in our full mycotoxin uh, model, we tried, we tried looking at interaction terms with EED and these mycotoxins, um, expecting that if that pathway was there, perhaps with that double, a combination of both these um, si situations in, in the child might be exponentially worse. Um, and we didn't really see those relationships. And so as you saw in that table, it's LM was put in as a control variable or as a additional explanatory variable um, and didn't, didn't quite come through. It, it remained Strong, it remained associated with the weight and length as simple measures, but just we couldn't um, detect it elsewhere. So 
I'm, I'm happy to look into a little bit more and share with you, Chris, too, as to like what other ways we looked at it. It's been a while, um, but it just uh, didn't come through as quickly in terms of being a clear um, combination effect. effect sure. Yeah, no, that, that and, yeah, and I think that uh, those of us who, who are uh, new to this field might think of uh, the blood assays of, of alpha toxin as being directly related only to food contamination. But indeed, one could argue that if a child has increased uh, permeability to toxins, their blood level might be related not just to unsafe food, but uh, an intrinsic problem with their small bowel. So um, that's great. Um, Dr. Seifel, let me ask you this. I noted in one of the slides that the nutritional value was especially concerned uh, for people ticking off the dairy foods. Is there a reason why dairy food was especially concerned about um, nutritional value, do you think? Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Chris. Yes, actually, in case of dairy, recently we have several kind of uh, occurrence or kind of news in the news, actually, nowadays, in different... Uh, heavy metal contamination in the dairy products. Mm. So mm. that's maybe kind of reflected in the results, like that's why consumer, and also, I mean, dairy milk is highly nutritious and for, particularly for the child. So that's why maybe, I mean, they're more concerned on the nutritional value of the dairy products, particularly in, in terms of child nutrition perspective. Excellent. Excellent. Um, a follow-up question was, uh, you noted some characteristics of people who had more or less degree of concerns about food safety and quality, uh, listing some demographic uh, uh, factors that were related to those outcomes. But I was surprised that you didn't actually measure, or maybe you didn't, didn't mention it, food insecurity per se. So are people who are more food insecure less concerned about food safety and quality in your eyes? Yeah, thank you. Actually, but we have not included that variable, but you might have seen the income is there because mm -hmm. we categorize the income in different like uh, five groups. And we see like the compared to the baseline, which is the poorest one, the other group all are significant. That means income is highly correlated with the concern. And maybe, I mean, it's debatable that income and food security all is not sure, linked, sure. But, yeah, yeah. but there are some sort of links there. Excellent. But, yeah, we can look for, yeah. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a final question for you, uh, Dr. Islam, is the idea of um, how the data were collected, which was based on questionnaires, I imagine. Are there, are there any um, developments in your field where people, in addition to looking at self-reported, outcomes, are there ways in which we can look at specific uh, consumer um, behaviors in terms of their actual food purchases uh, and choices and uh, different preparations, et cetera? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, as I said, and you also said, I mean, yeah, this is based on uh, the survey and mostly like the economists, we rely on the survey, but nowadays, kind of interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research is happening. So, I mean, if like economist, nutritionist collaborate, then some, such type of a study, I mean, can be possible to do that. And also like this study is larger part of the nutrition innovation lab. So there are different components of the questionnaire as well as also there are some sort of uh, technique that you mentioned also there, but I have not analyzed such issues here actually. Yeah. But in Thank future, you. yeah, look for it. Yeah. Yeah, it might be an interesting uh, avenue to pursue. Yeah. Uh, and Joanna, one final question for you about aflatoxin, which is, uh, should we think about it as any amount in the bloodstream is abnormal? Is there, are there, are there cutoffs? Is this like a heavy metal issue where any amount of, say, lead in the child's body and blood is abnormal? Um, great question. Might be a little of a subjective answer. I'm not sure. But there is no current threshold cutoff to determine um, what's dangerous. Definitely, we don't quite know what if we this relationship is secured with growth, what is that threshold? We, in our analysis, treated it as any 
aflatoxin is bad. It's a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And we that's how we we treated it in, in our study. But I think that one thing to establish further within the aflatoxin field is, is that. Um, excellent. So in, in concert with our uh, uh, last day or so of panels, I'm going to circulate back to all the panelists to, to give us a, a 30 second or a one minute uh, peek at the future of what their specific field uh, might um, and be entertained by over the next decade. We've looked back at the past decade, what's going to happen in the next 10 years. Uh, so let me go in the order in which the presentations uh, were going. Uh, Jackie, can I ask you to start with a one minute peek to the future? Uh, sure, definitely. Thank you, Chris, for that opportunity um, to wrap up. I think I've done a pretty good job and my, and my panelists have have, um, have helped with this and, and establishing that EED is just a very difficult condition um, to study and we still have a lot of unanswered questions. Um, it may just well be that the condition is much more heterogeneous than we ever thought. Um, there just might just be different causes, different pathways, different consequences um, depending on the setting and even among different um, individual children in the same setting. So we certainly need uh, more research. Uh, to catalyze this, I would recommend um, you know, research into better human biomarkers, um, including kind of multiplex um, biomarkers, um, better ability to translate uh, from animal models, um, and just general kind of more collaboration uh, across disciplines um, would be good. And, um, and I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that we're also stuck in the dark ages. Those of us who study ED, there is a lot of, um, you know, very cutting edge and innovative work. Um, I mentioned uh, some of the multiplex assays, but also harnessing the, poly the power of omics technologies and stable isotope techniques have, have, have now been offered um, as ways to, to uh, in the future, really um, better kind of diagnose or characterize EED. Um, which would really help the field. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you. To add to that, I would say um, in the next 10 years, I see more studies using these newer biomarkers to measure EED, but also focusing on the gut microbiota and using that as the target for intervention studies, um, studies to even measure burden. Um, that's where I see the field going. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Andrews Trevino, your, your view of the future. I think we already mentioned a few uh, futuristic things that we can do with, with validating the measures a little bit more, understanding, expanding our, our understanding of the other mycotoxins we don't understand as much. I think also in addition to that, I mean, within the field of food safety, there's a lot more beyond mycotoxins too. Um, I, so I would also encourage research um, being a little more comprehensive in that sense. And I think that one other thing that I mentioned in my presentation, um, the whole piece on going forward research and strong design, um, I would encourage that too. We we had our our design that was really strong and was, as I as I mentioned, allowed us to answer a lot of questions. Um, so I would encourage that kind of research design when possible. Excellent. Dr. Islam, final words. Um, thank you. Uh, I think food safety is kind of an em emerging issues in particular nowadays in the developing world. So uh, including in Bangladesh, actually, we have many things is going on in different organizations, in, in different bodies, including the policymakers are thinking about in line with that. So, and we all know that it's very much linked with nutrition and food security. So I think uh, in my study, we really focus mostly on the urban, uh, sorry, rural, but we often see food safety quality is kind of urban phenomenon in, develop as, in developing countries. So maybe in future, we need to look at both urban and rural, as well as importantly, uh, nowadays also debate on diversification versus commercializations in the, in the literature. So maybe we can also look for who is enhance food safety as well as uh, food security and nutrition. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you for your final words and thank you to all of our panelists for really an excellent discussion. Um, I think we have a, a two minute break built in and look forward to the next session. Thank you to all.